Today's episode of the Occupy Wall Street show is brought to you by Mt. Gox, M-T-G-O-X dot com, and The Thank You Economy by Gary Vaynerchuk. We are the 99%. 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 Welcome to the first Numero Uno premiere episode of the Occupy Wall Street show. We're really, really excited to bring you this new uh, show that we're launching. And um, this is the first episode, as I said. Um, Occupy Wall Street's been going on over a month now. Um, It's a really, really exciting movement. There's just so much to say about it. We decided to launch a whole show about it. One of the things we want to do is bring to you um, a real in-depth look at how Occupy Wall Street movement actually works. Because what you're seeing in the mainstream media is uh, very, very, very tiny little 30-second segments and often very biased you know, opinions and so on. Uh, a lot of organizations and entities and even political parties are trying to co-opt what they're doing. But what we want to do is bring you actual uh, leaders, or uh, peop- not leaders, but facilitators of each of the actual working groups 
um, to come in and interview them and talk about exactly how the, the process works, the direct democracy, which most people, most Americans, uh, this is a new concept to, for them. They haven't, they didn't even know that this was going on, but this is the core fundamental nature of this Occupy Wall Street movement is the direct democracy that's happening there. So we're really, really excited to bring that to you. And we're also going to have uh, as they do at the General Assemblies, at all the Occupy Movement uh, gatherings, they have a uh, thing called a soapbox, so that um, after the General Assembly, people can just uh, take turns and get up on the soapbox and, and uh, say whatever they want to say. And as long as people are willing to listen, people can listen, so that they can kind of vent their, their views and their opinions, so everybody's voice can be heard. So we'll have... Um, a few times a week, we're going to have um, a facilitator from each of the working groups, uh, one at a time, explaining all the intricate details of that. And then a couple times a week, we'll have a soapbox segment. Um, and that's what it is today. We're, uh, I first want to show you this video. This was um, from Friday, October 14th. As you may recall, on Thursday the 13th, um, Mayor Bloomberg, actually, I think previous to that, had announced that uh, they were going to evict the uh, protesters from Liberty Square for cleaning, for cleaning. Um, and many people said that they thought that that was the uh, sort of just a premise for getting them out and then they wouldn't let them back in um, except under, you know, real strict root, uh, um, rules and so on. Well, uh, the media got a hold of that and uh, everybody was anticipating a real uh, confrontation. So we were down there till midnight on the night of the 13th and then I was back down there really early, like 5 or 6 a.m. on the 14th. And um, we were shooting video down there, uh, checking it out. I've never seen such an enormous parade of police power, you know, cruisers going by, just dozens and dozens of them with those sirens blare, blaring for no reason, just you know, buses and, and vans full of officers. It seemed like a, a sea of officers. Um, and uh, just like this huge, enormous show of force to, to kind of show off their presence. So anyway, we were, everyone was expecting this big, big um, uh, event to happen. Of course, I was down there with my camera and my battery, my battery was good, but my uh, SD card was full. So I was like, ah, cursing myself for not having an extra one. So I left. I actually left, and I figured I was probably going to miss all the action, uh, but I, I had to run back to the studio to get some more SD cards. And when I left, uh, it was very interesting. I was uh, quite a few blocks up north uh, to grab the subway, and I want to show you what I saw. This was around 10 a.m. on Friday the 14th, and uh, you don't see the very beginning because I didn't get the camera started in time, but what you would have seen if I had started the camera right from the beginning was... Uh, a couple police cars uh, with their sirens wailing and this uh, big, enormous SUV, uh, you know, like, a, I don't know what it was, but some sort of a big, black, blackened windows SUV uh, in between them, like obviously a police escort of some VIPs. And before the SUV even came to a complete stop, the doors flung open and these two guys jumped out. So I knew it was somebody important, but I didn't know who it was. But uh, take a look at this video. So as you can see, this is right after they jumped out. And uh, I recognized later that that is uh, Ray Kelly, who's the uh, chief of police for NYPD. And I don't know, apparently a bodyguard. So, um, but you can't tell right there from the video, but they literally jumped out of the vehicle. I mean, the doors flew, flung open before they even stopped. And uh, he was walking very briskly. You could tell he was, he was in a hurry. Um, from the moment he jumped out of that car and uh, was kind of scurrying right into City Hall. But I thought that was a little bit interesting because, uh, as you know, the, the turn of events that happened right after that, um, Bloomberg backed down and to um, the pressure of the people. There were so many people showed up to, uh, to uh, show their support. So anyway, so today we have with us um, uh, our great friend Dan O'Connor, who is running for U.S. Congress, uh, New York District 12. Welcome, Dan. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so uh, we, I want to talk with you about uh, Occupy Wall Street and uh, also about the global central bankers and that whole situation. I know that you're very knowledgeable about, about that. First, the, uh, we, I don't know if you are aware, we, we talked briefly about what is happening like right now. As of, well, last night, uh, Albany, Albany, New York, the uh, uh, what I read on Twitter and, and on the, the uh, forums and stuff is that 
the police actually defied the orders of the mayor of Albany and the governor, Cuomo, of New York. Um, that They ordered them to arrest these 700-plus protesters, and the police said no. They just said, absolutely no, we're, we're not going to do it. They're peaceful protesters, and uh, if we start arresting peaceful protesters, there's going to be a riot, and we don't have the manpower to do it. And they actually said that um, we are the experts in policing. The governor and the mayor are not. What do you think about that? I think it's great. I think it's encouraging. Um, you know, all across the U.S., we, we certainly see many instances and cases of police brutality, and they're overstepping their boundaries and, and abusing their power, uh, and this is undeniable. But at the same time, most, most of the police officers out there are, in fact, good people, mm-hmm. and, you know, I, I think the people down at Occupy Wall Street or the Occupy movements you know, all across the country can pretty much be assured that you know, this is not going to turn into uh, martial law, mm-hmm. at least any time in the immediate future. Yeah, let's hope not. The, uh, you know, it's, I, I read a, twit, a, tweet, a tweet on Twitter today. Um, somebody had said, uh, have, have the police ever been on the right side of liberty and justice? And I said, well, they were last night in Albany. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a, it's a start. The problem isn't really the police or the police officers themselves. I think it's the, it's the people giving the orders, the, the, the power structure that's up above them. But uh, interesting that it was coming directly from the governor who right in his own backyard in Albany you know saying arrest these people and the mayor even by under orders of the governor to arrest these people and uh, the police said no they're not breaking any laws and they're peaceful protesters and we're not going to do it now then the other news is this morning like literally right before we started the show um we were watching the live stream um, and seeing that something like at 5 a.m. California time, the police came into Oakland, California, and started arresting people and um, using pepper spray and uh, what is it called? I don't L R A D. I don't even know what that is. L R A D. They said they deployed it, but they hadn't used it yet. So um, they're uh, you know they're taking their their stuff and their equipment and basically, um, you know, arresting everybody out there. And this is in Oakland. I'm kind of surprised because I always think of San Francisco as being pretty liberal and open-minded, sure. that Bay Area, but um, it's, wow, amazing. Well, I'll tell you, the, the district where I'm running, it borders on the financial district. So mm-hmm. it is quite close for me, mm-hmm. and it's also coincidental that this is going to be a big part of, of my campaign platform you know, uh, the corporatism. I'm very critical of the corporatism. I'm very critical of the banks in bed uh, with the government yeah. uh, through the Federal Reserve System. There are a lot of people down at Occupy Wall Street. I've, I've visited a few times, and a lot of them are very critical of the Federal Reserve um, System because yeah. it in itself is the, the essence of corporatism, of cronyism. It is mm-hmm. the government connected to the banks, yeah. which in many ways it, it controls the economy. Yeah. My, I, my Occupy Wall Street sign says, and the Fed, they're all in bed, and the Fed owns the bed. And then I just list them all, basically everything. I mean, it's like corpora- all the corporations in that, you know, including, you know, uh, petrochemical and pharm- the, the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, everybody from A to Z, all the, all the, all the global corporations that are, we are kind of sort of known evildoers, you know, they're, they're all uh, owned. And, but... Um, beyond that, the uh, the government basically, all, if they own all the politicians in, in both parties, and they don't, it's not like they they bribe them after the fact either. It's that they got them elected in the first place, so they didn't have to buy them. They own, already owned them before they ran. Absolutely. And my opponent, who I'm challenging, um, she gets most of her campaign money from banks uh, and the financial uh, yeah. companies in New York. She coincidentally coincidentally sits on the. Uh, finance committee in Congress and uh, mm. Goldman Sachs was her largest donor in the previous mm. election and again they're giving a lot of money to her mm-hmm. and she's very much entrenched with the system and entrenched with the establishment this is something that I have it's, it's tough to fight up against because yeah. as, you, as you mentioned they do have a lot of influence and control mm-hmm. over the politicians exactly. who they fund yeah yeah, that's that's going to be a huge problem. I um, there was something about um, Stephen Colbert created a, an, a super PAC. Did you hear about that? <laughs> and uh, it's the story that I got. Something about in the process of doing it, kind of on a lark as a joke, you know, because he's a comedian. But um, he discovered that although donations ha- um, could not be anonymous. Um, you could create another kind of a pack that is anonymous. And that the way these guys are doing it is the vast majority, almost all of their donations, go through this anonymous pack. And then the anonymous pack 
writes one check to the, to the regular PAC. So in effect, they just bypass the whole system and their donations can be completely anonymous. Yes, uh, it is very rigged, the whole donation system and the way that it works. Mm -hmm. It very much favors the large corporations. It favors the establishment, uh, the Mm -hmm. status quo. Um, You know, Obama got most of his funding from Wall Street, and they helped basically propel him onto the national stage. Uh, It's well uh, well documented. It's well known now that he he was funded, got most of his funding uh, from Wall Street. And now, again, we're seeing the same thing with the other establishment candidate, mm-hmm. Mitt Romney. He's getting mm-hmm. most of his money from banks, from Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street, um, in many ways, they, they, they like the status quo. They profit from the status quo. Therefore, they throw man- money at it, and they do what they can to, to mm-hmm. keep it. Hmm. So if you were evil and corrupt and you had the sole license and monopoly to print the money, mm-hmm. what would you do? Pretty much kind of like, uh, the, I imagine, what the Federal Reserve does. They, if, if they can print trillions of dollars, then they can buy anything, including every politician. So how, does, how do the American people combat that? How, how, do we, how could we elect people in Washington and, and otherwise that, are, um, that really represent us and, and know for sure that they aren't bought and paid for by, by the Federal Reserve, by these bankers, this, this whole entire infrastructure. It's, it's a giant pyramid. Either. It also, it's not, it's not the local banker, the, the community bank that you deal with. It's just the gigantic pyramid. And even Wall Street's not at the top. The top, top, I think, is the Federal Reserve, the owners of the Federal Reserve, which actually is the same guys. Just, when you get to the top, it's, they're just a small little club. Right. So how do, how do the American people uh, combat that? How are we going to find candidates that aren't owned? Right. I think, I, think, I think movements like the Occupy movement are great. You know, I think change, real change in the country does come from the grassroots. Mm-hmm. Tea Party, you know, I, don't, I might not agree with every, all members of the Tea Party, but it is in fact a grassroots movement. Mm-hmm. And you know, this is where real change comes from all throughout history, all across the world. Change does come from the grassroots. Yeah. And a great thing about what's going on in recent years is that people have come to identify that the source of the problem is, in fact, the Federal Reserve Bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's, it's not 20% tax rate versus 25% tax rate, which is really what, mm-hmm. what we see going on in, in the political debate for the most part. Yeah. Uh, should we tax them 20%? We tax them 30%. Uh, it's not nearly as relevant as the main source of the problem, which is the Federal Reserve. Right. It is because of the Federal Reserve that the debt problem is as bad as it is. It is because of the Federal Reserve that the booms and busts occur within the economy. We just saw the biggest boom, housing prices through the roof, quadrupled in five years. This is not mm. a uh, not people natural. decided suddenly, oh, I, want, I like houses. No, right. this is a result of money printing and low, art, low interest rates uh, by the Federal Reserve Bank. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, but yes, uh, it's, it's great that people are, and more and more people are waking up to the source of the problem. And although, as you mentioned, you know, the mainstream media does try to control the debate, when they go down to Occupy Wall Street, I was there last week and Geraldo showed up. <laughs> and um, you know, they try to make it seem as though they're really getting into yeah. uh, Occupy Wall Street, what's going on down there. But they brought in their own guests. <laughs> they're talking about... Uh, Herman Cain, nine nine nine, half of the time. Oh my God. They really weren't, you know, getting in with the with the people and the movement. It was really just a stage for yeah. them to. I was going to say shoot. they should have just done it on a green screen and had an artificial image of like, like as if they were there. Exactly. Because they're not really there at all. They're not talking to people. They're just bringing, like you said, bringing in their own guests, have their own agenda, uh, just commandeer the whole thing and call it Occupy Wall Street. Yes. So, which is what we're we're going to be very careful not to do because we don't. I don't want to co-opt this. I mean, that's the that's the thing I've been actually preaching a little bit is if there is a dogma or uh, doctrine or whatever for Occupy Wall Street, I think number one should be don't let it be co-opted by anybody's political agenda. And so that's why I want to uh, hear. I, we are going to have the the, the uh, soapbox thing where people can spew their own opinions, and they will be di- you know varying and diverse. But the, the main, um, you know, official Occupy Wall Street stuff is the working groups of people. And so that's why I want to hear directly from them. How are these working groups going? And, and I especially am interested in the, the team they call facilitation, which is about um, 
the direct democracy. I mean, people, they're not even talking about this on the media. I mean, barely, barely they mention that they actually, what, the, what goes on in these general assemblies, this whole idea of the, the sign language that they use and, and how they're actually putting proposals forward and how people are actually voting on them and that nobody's voice is more uh, important than anybody else's. It's really, really cool. There, there's uh, one video I saw where um, this guy was interviewed and he said, He's like, he's older than me, he's, you know, whatever. Um, and he said uh, he's never been so proud to be an American, to be down there and to see how that operates. And that's what I want to bring to light. I want to show people, you know, what, how that really works. Excellent. So, so the, um, okay, um, how does it, uh, what do you want to talk about as far as the central banks go? I, I mean, what I don't understand is, I mean, I can only imagine, but um, the Federal Reserve, I guess the, 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 the people who own the Federal Reserve are the same guys that are the the bankers, the J.P. Morgan and and all these uh, huge bankers. So are they are they the same guys, or do they, does one own the other? They very they sit on the board, you know, at the Federal Reserve Bank here in New York. Obviously, the biggest of all the different branches all across the U.S. The largest one is in New York. Obviously, mm-hmm. the most influential one. Mm-hmm. These are the ones the where world, yeah. J, you know Jamie Dimon of of J.P. Morgan mm-hmm. sits at the head of it and. You know, David Rockefeller of J.P. Morgan Chase over the years used to sit at the head of it, and uh, you know members of Goldman Sachs sit at the head and they make okay. decisions. Coincidentally, these are also the banks that happen to do extremely well uh, in trading derivatives and mm-hmm. predicting the way the market will will change in the future. They predict it and then they make it happen, and then they win the bet. Yeah, and then they they create derivatives and then they bet against their own derivatives because they know that they're not worth anything and win the bet. <laughs> it's crazy, right? The, so they're not really separate entities if they're all owned by the same few, the same old boys club, right? They're all the same. And then, um, and, peop- and obviously the, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation like Walmart or Coca-Cola. I mean, there, I, I heard that um, the Federal Reserve, there's a Federal Reserve board. People get, get misled and it, it seems so intentional by design because you only have to have like one or two layers of complexity and the average person is like, oh, that's too complicated. I don't understand, you know. But I, I mean, even the name Federal Reserve, it sounds governmental and it sounds like a good thing. It has reserves or something, mm-hmm. but uh, it's, it's just like it may as well be called Starbucks or Walmart or Coca-Cola or whatever. Um, or, uh, but then the other thing is that there's a Federal Reserve Board, mm-hmm. which I heard like, people are appointed to that board, like the president appoints somebody to that board and so on. Mm-hmm. But that board has absolutely no power or authority over the actual Federal Reserve. They're completely separate entities. They just happen to share the same name. It's just like the whole thing is a fraud. The whole thing is a big sham. And who reports to who? You know, it's like people think that the government is actually, uh, you know, it, um, has authority over the Federal Reserve. But it seems to me like the government absolutely reports to the Federal Reserve from beginning to end, and every politician in between, almost everyone. You're absolutely right. Uh, on the bright side, though, these issues are coming up in Congress now. Mm-hmm. In Congress, they are coming out, and they are bringing people to the table, like Timothy Geidner, who was head of the New York Federal Reserve for years, now Treasury Secretary, very, very closely affiliated with Goldman Sachs. Yeah. But he is being questioned now. And, and this, is a, this is a step in the right direction. They are mm-hmm. asking him questions. Mm-hmm. They're asking him questions like, hey, bef- right before the bailouts took place, why were you on the phone with Goldman Sachs all day, every day? Mm-hmm. You know, we're looking at your call log. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're asking him questions like, how are these people, how do they become appointed? Oh, you know, good. who decides how these people are appointed? And, and it's great that these questions are being asked now because for many, many years, the Federal Reserve Bank was essentially neglected in political yeah. discussions. Yeah. Um, in Congress, basically, it was hands-off. They do what they want. Nobody understands it. They use their technical jargon, mm-hmm. scientific graphs and charts and you know, uh, interest people. rates. And yeah. people are like, eh, I, don't, I don't really Whatever. want to try to understand that. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, they one level of do. complexity, and it's like, oh, that's too... Too calm. All I know is I get paid, and it's not enough to pay the rent or whatever. That's all they know. And and yeah, if you if you people use jargon to talk circles around people. I know this from my background in computers that uh, technologists. You know, basically, my, what my saying was: if I know one thing more than you, then I'm the consultant. You pay me. You know, and so if I can talk jargon. It makes me sound important and official, and I can just confuse you. And you and most people are embarrassed to say, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, but not me. 
I'll sit there and go, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Can you please explain this to me in English? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, if they can't, if they insist on the jargon, it's because they're hiding something. They, either that or they just don't have any ability to communicate with a human being. But, you know, that usually people use jargon and complexity just to, because they don't want to tell you the truth. And, and lots of euphemisms, mm-hmm. you know, uh, QE3, uh, they should really just call yeah. it money printing. Which yeah, is. exactly, money printing. Yeah, I always say QE3, it should be called the Titanic. It's, oh, God, it's just so, so... Um, if, if Americans and the world really knew how the thing works, mm-hmm. they would go, they would just, they, they really would write in the streets. They would just be, you know, absolutely... You know, I think they, they are taking to the streets now, uh, and people are like, but what are their demands? I ran into this lady in the elevator the other day, and she saw my, I had a T-shirt that I had, somebody had given me at Occupy Wall Street, and said 99% and all that. And she said, um, and I said, she's like, what do you think about that? And I said, wow, it's growing. This is, the, this is the biggest thing since the American Revolution. I think this is really, really going to be huge because um, it's not a political thing. It's not the red team versus the blue team. These are 20 to 25-year-olds primarily leading the way who are very well educated. Mm-hmm. Degrees from William & Mary, you know, law degree from George Brown, whatever. And they... They know their stuff, mm-hmm. and they've educated themselves not only through education through the universities, but also through the internet. They, I mean, it's self-serve education, but they know the score. They know how these things work for the most part. So um, they're not biased. They're not. They, somebody did a poll, and they said more than seventy percent of them are independent. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, independent in terms of a political party okay. affiliation. Mm-hmm. They they did a poll, yeah, mm-hmm. and they said seventy more than seventy percent are independent. They. Mm-hmm. They, they're, they're not any more approving of Obama than they were of Bush. Mm-hmm. They know that it's, it's just more of the same. They voted for change and didn't get any. And, you know, mm-hmm. they know that the thing is a sham. Mm-hmm. And it, we've kind of, like, my generation has kind of always known that, but it was kind of like the, the elephant in the room. Like, everybody kind of knows that, but what can you do, you know? But these kids are like, we know that, and we are going to do something about it. Because, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, this is the beginning of our lives. You know, we, we've got a whole life ahead of us, and damn, you know, this isn't right. So they're going to do something about it. So they're taken to the streets, and oh, so this lady in the elevator asks, so what do they want? Mm. And I said, well, if I had to sum it up in one word, I would say democracy. Mm. If I had a few other words I would say, in a tweet, I would say what they really want is what we always thought we had. We thought this was a free country. Mm. We want um, freedom, liberty, and democracy. That's what we want. And real freedom, liberty, and democracy. Real democracy, which we haven't had. I mean, <laughs> since 1913 at least. I don't know. You know. When was the last time we had real freedom, liberty, and democracy in this country? It's just been a sham. It's been a, a Hollywood um, you know, story. I mean, that, you know, America, land of the free. But it's not. It hasn't been. It has been um, a tyranny. A tyranny of the bankers. <sighs> you know? So um, we want real democracy. We really want um, people to actually have a say mm-hmm. in, in how things are run. Um, I also saw um, a, uh, an image on Twitter this morning, which actually I, I had, um, this thought had occurred to me the other day, and um, I hadn't even said anything to anybody, but then this morning I saw an image somebody tweeted, um, which was really interesting, because I knew, you know, we talk about the 99%, meaning the, the top 1%, what is it, the top 1% wealthiest people in this country have um, 80% of the wealth or something, like, some number like that. And um, so that's where this came from. We are the 99%. Um, but I also knew this statistic, which most people don't know, that um, if you are even the poorest people in the U.S. are the top 1% wealthiest people in the world. Because when you look at you know, starvation and famine and you know, poverty throughout the planet, mm-hmm. um, the poorest Americans are the top 1% of the world. So I thought that was just a little bit, wow. of, little bit of an interesting karma-like thing wow. that, uh, you know, we, we have been the top, all Americans have been the top 1% of the entire planet. Uh, but within the United States, you know, it's a whole other thing, which actually makes it even more grotesque to think of these billionaires and central bankers who are trillionaires, literally they can print trillions of dollars. You know, it's just grotesque how much wealth they have and how little good it's doing, you know. So, all right, well, we've got to take a break here real quick and uh, thank our sponsors, because if it weren't for our sponsors, we wouldn't be here. So, uh, first, it's Mt. Gox, M-T-G-O-X dot com. Um, if you haven't heard of Bitcoin, it's actually um, a perfect 
uh, tie-in with the Occupy Wall Street movement because there are people are actually getting arrested trying to close their bank accounts. I don't know if you've heard about that, but um, you know, Citibank and uh, some other bank, I think it was Bank of America, where they're actually arresting people who are going in and closing their bank accounts. They're having these big events where everybody goes and closes their bank account. Well, Bitcoin is sort of the money of the future. It's an amazing technology. If you're not aware of it, check out bitcoinme.com. And uh, Mt. Gox is the world's leader in um, online exchange sites, which means it's where you can buy Bitcoin for U.S. dollars or sell Bitcoin for U.S. dollars. And not only U.S. dollars, but 16 different currencies. So it's mtgox, mtgox.com. Check it out. And uh, while you're there, thank them for sponsoring the Occupy Wall Street show. And <clears throat> the Thank You Economy by Gary Vaynerchuk is... Uh, um, Gary Vaynerchuk is a best-selling author, and uh, he's just come out with this new book. Uh, you can check it out at thankyoeconomybook.com. This book is amazing. It's actually about if you have a business or corporation or whatever, and you want to use the technology of social media to bring your business back to the old days when there was such a thing as customer service and um, a real personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with your customer. Um, it's an amazing read, so check it out. The Thank You Economy by Gary Vaynerchuk. ThankYouEconomyBook.com. And thank you for, uh, thank them for sponsoring the, uh, the Occupy Wall Street show. So what else? What else? What else? <clears throat> so the, how, how do Americans then take back Washington? I guess the answer is government. We have to have, we, it has to start there. It has to start with the people, and we have to just do a complete sweep of Washington and replace everybody there? <laughs> How do we do that? Well, that's part of what I'm hoping to accomplish and what I'm doing in running for office. Uh, and also, I think a big part of it is you know, spreading of ideas and people coming to realize uh, where the source of the problem is. And more and more people are waking up to that. And you know, the things like the Occupy Wall Street movement are great because it is grassroots. And you, and you go down there, and it's people talking, mm -hmm. people exchanging ideas. Yeah educating each other, debating. Uh, it's, it's civilized, the times that I've been down there. Yeah. And it's great, you know, people going back and forth and exchanging ideas. And when I'm down there, I'm obviously talking about my biggest concern, which is the Federal Reserve Bank, and it's right across the street from where these people are standing. Yeah, yeah. So what are you telling them about the Federal Reserve? Well, I mean, most people don't even know where it, where it came from, you know, why it, how it came about. Do most people still think it's part of the government? Uh, yeah, most, most people don't really know anything, anything about it, period. You know, they, they, a lot of people know that lots of trillions of dollars have been printed in recent years, mm -hmm. and you know, there were the bailouts, which are, which are unpopular. 80% mm -hmm. of the American public are against the bailouts. Yeah. But no, most people don't know where it, was, where it came from or how it was created or why it was created. They don't know that you know, J.P. Morgan's people and Rockefeller's people secretly got together a few years before its, you know, its formation and... And they, they came up with a plan and devised a plan in a way that in which they would get bailed out mm -hmm. when they made bad loans. Mm -hmm. And they would get bailed out by printing money. And this was, this was the plan for a while. Mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan, the biggest banker in the U.S., he's looking across the ocean saying, wait a second, these bankers in Europe, every time they make bad loans, they get bailed out by you know, the central banks. I want that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, he, he devised a way and he came up with a way. And now... Me, someone here in New York, everywhere I look, I see J.P. Morgan Chase Banks, yeah. coincidentally. Everything. Uh, they're the big ones, and they're, they've gotten all the favors, and uh, they, they work with the IMF and the, and the World Bank and, and obviously the Central Bank. And you know, Paul Volcker, the head of the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, a long time ago came straight out of Chase and J.P. Morgan. And, you know, it's all uh, mm -hmm. you know, inter, interconnected, and, 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 and the more people realize what's going on, the more repulsed they become, and, yeah. and they detest it. It doesn't matter what political party you are, Republican, Democrat, people hate the favors for, for the yeah. rich and, and they hate the, the cronyism and, and, and uh, uh, yeah. the whole system. The whole system. Even Visa, MasterCard, there's, there, you know, um, you see Citibank, Chase, everywhere you look, I mean, you, you think there's a lot of Starbucks out there, but when you look, you walk down the, I mean, now I'm like, I have this heightened awareness, and mm -hmm. like I got off the subway at Columbus Circle and I'm walking down this huge long corridor all the way to 57th Street. Every single billboard is taken by MasterCard Visa. 
MasterCard Visa, MasterCard Visa, MasterCard Visa. It's just like everywhere you look, that's what it is. And you know, we can see more Bitcoin signs. Yeah, exactly. We need more. For sure, we need more Bitcoin signs. That's true. How many are more are, are sprouting up? What, what sort of they're, well, it's it's slowly catching on. You know, um, it, the thing is, they obviously they don't have a hundred million dollars a year to put in TV commercials and so on, like uh, Mastercard Visa, and the, the banks just print their money to do it. But um, it, it, so it, it, another it's another grassroots movement because it's it's a peer to peer technology and it's completely open source and nobody's making money off of promoting it, you know, directly. So there's no um, you know there's no benefit to there's no budget for mass advertising how do we get it out there how do we get bitcoin how do we spread it how do we make it more uh, abundant uh, or i don't know i mean I, I, I what i'm doing in that regard is we're uh we do a weekly meetup for occupy wall street supporters mm-hmm. here we host and then we also do a bitcoin meetup too and they're kind of back to back so if people stay for the first one they they're going they're to learn about bitcoin mm-hmm. plus here on the occupy wall street show one of the things we're going to do is we're, we are going to bring up bitcoin occasionally we're going to talk about bitcoin because we're hoping that the audience that's interested in Occupy Wall Street will also uh, investigate Bitcoin. Because, you know, uh, if you don't know already, it is the money of the future. It's not a bank. Uh, it's not issued by a bank or a government. It's a completely open source free software. It's really like the people's own money. It's like the Internet itself. It's, it's all about uh, freedom. Uh, so uh, and it can't be controlled and shut down. I saw a video on YouTube about WikiLeaks. Uh, uh, they're talking about 95% of their funding, their donations have been cut off because of the government's control over MasterCard, Visa, and PayPal. So, um, you know, there's a perfect example how the government can just push a button and sh- they don't like who you're donating to, they just turn it off like a faucet. What about, um, you know, Wik- Wiki- WikiLeaks? <coughs> Can't Bitcoin work with, with WikiLeaks? Yes, actually they do. Um, well, Bitcoin works with anybody who wants to work with Bitcoin is not a company, so... If you accept Bitcoin for anything, you're accepting Bitcoin. There's no control over it, which is a good thing. Um, and yes, actually, um, for mm. s- several months now, WikiLeaks does accept Bitcoin donations. Excellent. Yeah, so that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, has it been active? Do you know? Do you know if there's I, a lot going in? I that don't way? know. I don't. I don't really know. We should have, uh, write to us. Uh, put up our email address there so they know. Occupy Show at uh, Only One TV. Send us an email and keep me informed of what's going on because I'm supposed to know. But uh, let us know. Do you know anything about how many Bitcoin donations? I'm sure these guys do. They're, they can easily check. Um, how many Bitcoin donations WikiLeaks has received, but um, it's a it's a really good alternative because you can buy Bitcoin. Speaking of our sponsor, Mt. Gox, you can literally go to mtgox.com and buy uh, Bitcoins with your dollars or yen or sixteen other currencies, um, and then just turn around and buy twenty dollars worth of Bitcoin and then send that twenty dollars to WikiLeaks as in the form of Bitcoin and completely bypass. And when you you know while you're at it. It's not just for WikiLeaks, of course. You can you can use it for anything, and it's just called you know financial privacy. You know that's the thing. These banks they control absolutely everything, and they know everything you do and what you buy and where you shop. They know way 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 too much information. And what's really disconcerting is um, is now that they can just say we don't like you donating to that cause. You know. Uh, by the way, Occupy Wall Street, if you go to OccupyWallST.org, that's their official website, um, they accept donations as Bitcoins too. And they even have a special one Excellent. for the live stream. If you want to donate specifically to support the live stream, they accept Bitcoin donations there too. So, you know, it's about financial privacy and it's also about, you know, screw the government's ability to uh, say you can't donate to this cause or that cause. That's not the government's mm-hmm. role. And, um, you know, people are starting to wake up to that and realize, actually, so Bitcoin is a perfect fit for, um, for this whole movement, the whole idea of, um, you know, alternate, alternative banking. There actually is a work group called Alternative Currencies. So I'm going to get involved in that, too, and make sure they're aware of Bitcoin. So I'm doing my part. You know, we'll, we'll try and educate people all the way around because all, all these ideas are synergistic. You know, definitely. Yeah, and I think, so. I think, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And, and I, I think it's a matter of identifying individuals or companies or groups out there who would benefit from Bitcoin yeah. and, and really trying to align with them. And, and then they could also help with the advertising and the marketing of it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So if you have a business or a brick and mortar shop, you know, or an online shop or any, any sort of content creation, you want to accept donations, 
You can accept donations via Bitcoin. Not for um, political campaigns, though, unfortunately. It, yeah, not for political campaigns, unless you go through those anonymous packs and all that crap. But, uh, but anyway, you can uh, go to BitcoinMe.com. is an educational website. This is a brochure that I created, Bit- BitcoinMe.com. Uh, that teaches people about just the basics of what Bitcoin is. And, and it, literally in five seconds, you can uh, get set up to accept Bitcoin donations or b- accept Bitcoin as, uh, as a business. So here we are talking about Bitcoin again. We, we never stop talking about Bitcoin, but it's, it is. It's a perfect tie-in for this. I mean, when we talk about banking, we talk about money, it's also related. You know, just, you know there's just no need to, uh, for the, f- first of all, you know, we talk about end the Fed and audit the Fed and, and, um, I mean, when people say end the Fed, do they mean literally to shut it down? What they really mean is to nationalize it, right? To bring it back to where it belongs in the Constitution, to Congress. Congress is the one who has the right to, uh, and the authority, the only authority, to issue money for the country, right? As per the Constitution, correct. I think a lot of people have different strategies and different ways. Those who oppose Federal Reserve and, and, and central banking have different solutions and different ways of trying to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think too many people advocate necessarily abolishing it, you know, overnight. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the uh, subscriptions that I uh, I like a lot is the idea of of actually removing legal tender laws and allowing any sort of currencies to float mm-hmm. in, in the economy. Yeah. And uh, this is very much in line with Bitcoin and, and that, that yeah. whole notion. But you know, the, the fact is that the government doesn't allow us to use use gold or silver to um, you know, transact and, and buy things. Well, actually, see, there's there's a technicality that people get really confused about, and I, I'm I'm pr- almost positive I'm right about this. Legal tender laws. People will get confused. Um, you, we we are allowed to transact business in silver and gold mm-hmm. and and baseball cards or anything we want, even alternate currencies. Bitcoin is legal, mm-hmm. and uh, these alternate private currencies are legal. Mm-hmm. We're allowed to do that, but what we're the, the legal tender means that we're required to accept it. And uh, we're legal tender in the U.S. is the Federal Reserve notes. And we're required to accept those notes in payment for a debt. But that's the only case. So if we don't have a debt, then I'm not required to take dollars. Like, for example, if I own uh, a burger shop and you pay in advance for your order, there's no debt, then I don't have to accept U.S. dollars. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but I know what you're talking about. There, there are a lot of new um, laws. I think, uh, actually, Ron Paul uh, initiated um, a bill that was, uh, was going to really eliminate the requirement to take U.S. dollars, even for debt, and also to, to literally, what am I trying to say, specifically uh, endorse alternate currencies, which I think is, is a good thing. Sure. And, and Ron Paul is certainly the most outspoken guy in D.C. on these issues, most of the other people in D.C. say, you know what, I don't understand it. It's not important to me. I'm not going to make it, you know, I'm not going to make a big mm-hmm. deal about it. Yeah. There are a handful of others, though, more and more getting on board, becoming more aware of it, mm-hmm. you know, speaking out against it. Yeah. Uh, Nancy Kaptur, uh, Dennis Kucinich, Democrats, mm-hmm. Andrew Jackson, the original, Dem- the first Democrat, Democratic president of the United States, abolished the central bank, effectively. Um, one-time New York state governor, um, Grover Cleveland was a very uh, outspoken uh, critic of, of central banking and the federal Res- and, and any sort of central bank. Mm-hmm. Very big proponent of gold, uh, who was also a Democrat here in New York. Maybe that's the way we can ident- Americans can identify which politicians aren't owned by the bankers because if they're against the central bank, they're not owned by the central bank. <laughs> uh, maybe that's a fair assumption. I don't know. And when you go online and you look uh, open source. Uh, dot com and you see where they get their donations from, you can see where some of these senators yeah. and some of these Congress people get their funding from. Yeah, that's the A main lot thing. of it comes from uh, these big banks. <clears throat> that's probably the best way. And then the other thing, too, is because they can say anything, as we know. They can just say anything. Like Obama, I mean, uh, he says all the right things, but what he does is just so, so opposite of what he says. Mo- most of the time, it seems like it's unbelievable but people are just so i don't know what they're just so busy or, or preoccupied or apathetic they just hear what he says and go oh i'm gonna vote for him i like what he says but they don't pay any attention to what he does oh my gosh yeah like, publicly he cr- he criticizes wall street and all the the, the things that yeah. go on down there and then at the same time he's that's where he's getting his yeah. his donations yeah. from 
Yeah, and we're going to end the war. One of the first thing I'm going to do when I get in office is end the war. Oh my gosh, just he's just done the opposite in every every regard. Now he says he's going to end the war before the end of the year, but well, I'll believe that when we see it, right? I think there. I was thinking about you know we're ta- the Occupy Wall Street thing. We're talking about uh, new revolutionary ways to to really change things up, to really stir up the pot, to reboot the system. And I was thinking, you know, this is one of the biggest problems we have is, um, you know, politicians saying one thing and doing another once they're elected. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking there should be a way to, um, to return them. Like, like give them 90 days. Pro- like if you get a new job, you get 90 days probation, right? They should have a 90-day probation period. And if they don't do all the things or at least try their damnedest to do all the things that they promised to do within the first 90 days, boom, they're just re- revote. You know, there'd be no one left in DC. <laughs> there wouldn't be, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you though, and, and I t- totally agree. But one way of dealing with it is term limits, mm-hmm. limiting these politicians to a certain amount of terms. I've pledged to only serve X amount of terms in office, and I'm, I've also pledged to only accept half of the salary available to me. But yes, term limits is a great solution because a lot of these politicians they're just concerned about re-election all the time. How do they get yeah. re-election? How do they get re-elected? Rather than focusing on what they're doing in the office at the time. Yeah. So when you can find them and you restrict them. Um, if they're not constantly worried about getting elected again. Yeah. And campaign contributions is another thing. I think they should only have a very small limit, and it should only be from citizens that are in their constituency, not from any corporations or mm. anybody else, just voters, basically. Mm. But anyway, we're out of time. But uh, thanks so much again for joining us. It's always always a pleasure. Time flies when we get started. Yeah, it's always a <laughs> pleasure. Th- thanks for having me on again. Sure, sure. Absolutely. All right, thanks. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks for joining us. Ciao.